Good morning. Uh, welcome to the talk. Um, my name is Jussi, and I'm here to talk to you about build systems. Usually when I talk to people about build systems, the reply I get is this, which is that all build systems are terrible, and why should I care? Well, let's, let's look into this. Um, if you were in the keynote, uh, one of the points made there was to explicitly say that don't build any more Python extensions. So, with that in mind, let's build a Python 3 extension module. And to make it more interesting, we're going to be using uh, C, C++, Rust, and Fortran, all in the same uh, extension module. And if you've ever done this with distutils, I salute you. Um, but here's the, how it would look like if you would do the same thing with Mesen. So uh, first you start the thing by defining the project, which in this case is called Polysnake, and the list of languages that you want to use. And the next step uh, is this function where we import Python 3. This is the uh, internal module system that we have in Mesen. And this Python 3 module has all the knowledge uh, to build Python extensions. And then we find a dependency. And this, uh, what it does is it goes out to the system and finds out uh, what are all the, the flags and, and linker flags and all that sort of things that you need to compile Python 3 applications. Uh, on Linux, this would be going into package config. And on other platforms, it does a bunch of other magic stuff. Uh, then we build a Rust static library. Uh, Rust is a bit special, so you have to do it this way. Um, but this is very quite quite simple. Um, and once you have that, then we can start the actual extension module building. So we call py3mod.extensionmodule, and we give it the name. And then we list the source files that we want to have in it. In this case, the C file, the CVP file, and the Fortran file. As, we, as you can see, we're using the modern F90 and not the F F77. And then we tell it that we uh, want to link the Rust library that we built earlier with this. And then we say that the dependencies of this project are the, the, is the Python dependency that is there. And this is the build definition in its entirety. This is all you need to write. And then you can just compile it, and then it goes. And this is, so we've been, the, the design goals of this system, uh, which were, which you could see someone on the previous slide, uh, go roughly like this. So the, the, the platforms that we have today, which is uh, Linux, OS X, Windows, BSDs, and a bunch of other ones, we want to support all of them. There are there several different compilers, GCC, Clang, Visual Studio, the Intel compiler. We want to support all of those. Uh, we try to hide as much of the platform-specific differences as possible, um, including compiler flags and all that sort of stuff. Basically, we just want to say, so I want compiler warnings to be enabled, and then we do that, and we take care of all the back-end stuff for you. And out of the box, we should provide support for tools that people are using today. There's very little point in having like 7,000 line make files where you copy bits from one place to another because this worked in one project, so maybe it works in this one as well, but then it doesn't, and then you're just uh, debugging for quite a long time. And the major architectural decisions of this system are not defined by what was in the default user land of SunOS 3.5 circa 1987, because that's what, like, for example, Auto Tools does. It's, it's, it's an admirable backwards compatibility claim, but like maybe it's time to let go. And at the very core of, of Mesen is the, the domain-specific language that is used for defining these builds. This is the thing that we have spent most of our energy on, so like getting as good of a definition language as possible. And let's look at some of the, the design calls that we have. Now first, we're going to look at some of the design not principles, because um, your product is defined by what it does not do more than it's defined by what it actually does, especially if you have something that is Turing complete. Uh, but the things that you specifically are saying that we're not going to do help you make uh, a lot better design decisions later on. So well, the main design thing is that Mesen is not a framework. There are a bunch of build systems 
which uh, say that no, this is not a build system, this is a framework with which you can build the perfect build system for your project, as if this was a good thing. So, no, we don't do that. We have, we're very specifically focused. We do this one thing, we do it well, we do it only. And the, there are a bunch of build systems that are declarative languages, and declarative languages are really awesome when they work, but the problem is that when they don't work, it's, it's really, really painful to debug. And um, because of this, which, uh, Mesen is not a declarative language, um, um, but we try to be as de declarative as possible. And it's not Turing complete. You can't specify your own functions or recursion or any of that. And the reason for this is that it makes tooling much more easier to write because it's easier to understand what the thing is actually doing. Uh, Mesen is not Python. Uh, it's could, it, it hides the fact that it's implemented in Python, so it could be re-implemented in any language at all. Um, so what, those were the not principles, so what are the actual design principles? Uh, basically, it boils down to this, is that every second you spend writing or debugging build definitions is a second wasted. You're not being productive when you're writing build definition rules. It's just boilerplate stuff that you have to do, so let's do as little of it as possible. Understandability is the most important thing. You should be able to look at your build definitions, like one file in isolation, have a, have a fairly good understanding of what it does. And it's not like some sort of spooky action at a distance where like, it says here that it's gonna do something, but actually over there, there's something else which completely changes everything. So we don't want to have any of that. Um, performance is important when it's, uh, it needs to scale to tens of thousands of files, even more. And uh, you have to have, have this sort of performance built in. All the, the core stuff needs to be properly done. You can't really like, like bolt on afterwards some sort of performance. Uh, Zen of Python, uh, explicit is better than implicit, awesome, um, all that good stuff. There should only be one way to do something and, and it should be obvious, awesome. So we stole all of that and basically we just steal everything that is good from anyone. If there's any good, there's no such thing as NIH. If someone has a good thing that they're doing and we are not, we're gonna steal it and we're gonna be proud about it. And the uh, one thing is that the build definitions should be shorter than writing the exact compilation commands by hand. So let's look at an example. A hello world uh, example looks like this. You define your project, and then you say, I wanna print an executable which has this one file. And this is 54 characters, and if you uh, do it manually, you said CC, W, all, all the stuff you compile, you link, and that's 54 characters. So we didn't quite reach the goal. However, if you use GCC, then it's 56 characters and we win. Um, we also want to be usable across all, for, for every single t use case. And the only dependency that we have is Python 3. And only Python 3 and the standard library. Anything outside of that, we're not allowed to use any of that. Uh, as an example, there are a bunch of build systems that are implemented in Java. And uh, the problem there is that there are many platforms on which uh, Java cannot run. It, like, there's no CPU, there's not enough memory all that stuff, and, and it's, a, it's a dependency that a lot of projects can't take, and, and even more projects don't want to take. But we want to be able to, to support all of those, and Python is really good because it's, it's quite small, it's self-contained, and it's everywhere. Um, for design, we've been uh, doing the 90-9-1 rule, which is that there's 90% case, and that should work out of the box. Because almost always this is the case, because you, Basically, there's only so many ways you want to build an executable with some sources. Uh, the 9% case should be possible, and for the 1% case, we can just say it's like, what you're doing is just so weird that we can't support that, and it would complicate everything else completely. And usually it's like, okay, but if you do this other thing instead, then we can just do that. But it's, it's totally okay for some of this, like, the weirdest of edge cases to just say, okay, we can't support that out of the box. You have to do some of your own magic. Um, in practice, this has been less than 1%, uh, so, but it's still there. And um, there are already people using it. There, there, there are like 100 build systems. Usually, most of them have about two users. Um, but we have managed to get some of them. And one of the, the major users thus far has been the g Multimedia Framework, which is uh, like 100, 150 plugins and a base platform. 
and all that good stuff, and they're using it to build on Windows and, and uh, OS 10 and Linux and all that stuff. And then there's uh, System D. Um, for those of you who don't know, System D is the first project, first process that is spawned when a modern Linux system uh, boots up, and it's like, like the manager process, which take care, takes care of all the other processes. And they actually have a, a outstanding uh, built uh, merge proposal to remove order tools altogether. So the, starting from the next release, they're probably going to have only Meson uh, for building. Uh, the X or uh, graphical user interface, so if you are, have uh, Linux laptops, you're probably using one of those, uh, using that. And if you're not, you're probably using Wayland, uh, which is the, the up and coming new graphical uh, GUI server, and that, and that has some uh, build definitions as well. And Western is the, the reference implementation window manager for that. Uh, the GTK widget toolkit, uh, which is it's pretty big, and it's multi platform, and, and in their four series, uh, they, they have merged the the Mesen build definition, and they're gonna. I, I think they're gonna at some at some point get rid of the old one, but it's it's not not yet happening. Uh, a lot of GNOME projects are are going as well, Nautilus and a bunch of other ones. And th there's the PTV nonlinear video editor, which is also implemented in Python. It's a pretty cool project. You should totally check it out. And uh, on the website, we have a list of of a bunch of other projects that are also also using this. And one of the, the main reasons why people are switching into Mesin is that you get uh, some fairly hefty compile time improvements. So as an example, uh, System D on Linux went from 16 minutes to compile to 2 minutes and 32 seconds. And if that seems weird to you, it seems weird to me. I went through these slides like four times, and every single time I saw this one, it's like, that can't be right. I have to re-verify that. And, and, and every single time, it's still 2 minutes and 32 seconds. And, and and, and uh, so it's it's fairly heavy, heavy difference. Uh, if you are compiling Wayland on Raspberry Pi, it went from six minutes to a minute. And there's uh, the Freeda.re, which is a debugging toolkit, and their cross compilation time to iOS went from six minutes to one and a half. Uh, in practice, what we seem to find is that um, projects can go up to ten to twenty times faster if they're make based. And um, especially if you are on Windows, because on Windows, uh, file system operations are like abysmally slow. And uh, because we don't use make, and, and we are not going to use make ever, uh, we don't have this problem. And for incremental builds, the difference is even bigger, because there's a bunch of optimizations that we do where we can skip relinking of stuff. And so we haven't done any large-scale tests with uh, other Ninja generators, like CMake, for example, has a Ninja backend. And, but it seems that we produce slightly more efficient files, but this, is like, uh, this hasn't been conclusively proven either way. So there was talk about um, built-in support for stuff. So we support uh, the sanitizer, so address sanitizer, memory sanitizer, UB sanitizer, all stuff. It just likes. Toggle the switch, say, I want this enabled, and then you have it. Coverage report, pre-compiled headers, can build all of the, the things that you would expect. And, and like scan build is the static analyzer that comes with Clang. And if you have it installed, it, the, it, there's a target called scan build. And you just like, run it, and then it runs the thing. And uh, reproducible builds, that's another other interesting thing. This is a big, big uh, thing that is going on with Debian and a bunch of other projects, where you basically want to prevent the uh, generation of, of binary packages, which have flaws that are not in the original source. So if you can produce from the same source files the same bit-for-bit -bit identical binary files from many different people are going to do this, then you can be fairly certain that the, the binary that you have is actually proper and you haven't been backdoored. And basically, we want to support everything uh, like within reason, because there's no point in everyone trying to reinvent the wheel of how do I support this specific little one tool. You just put, do it once in the core system, and then everyone can use it. Um, we also have a, a unit testing framework for running your tests, uh, which includes stuff like uh, setting your environment to so have set environment variables and command line arguments and things to run and all that sort of stuff. And we log. 
uh, standard output, standard error, how long it took, all of that good stuff. And excuse me, um, it's easy to add support for stuff like Valgrind, and all tests are run in parallel by default, which is particularly nice if you are running Valgrind, because then they're about 10 to 20x slower than they usually would be. And you can run the test suite multiple times if you want to. Uh, you can run the tests under GDB, which is kind of nice as well. And then you can just run tests under GDB until they fail. And then you just like leave your machine running if you have a flaky test. And then you come back to it and, oh, no, there's the, the GDB prompt for the one, the one in 1,000 runs that actually failed, which is kind of nice as well. Uh, cross compilation, we all, uh, of course, do. Uh, a full Canadian cross, if you don't know what that means, it's uh, probably not very important, but if you do know what it means, uh, then it's qu probably quite important for you, and, and we support that fully. Um, for uh, Linux and Linux cross compilation, that's being used uh, a lot, and there are people who compile from Linux to Windows, so they're uh, using the MinGW packages that come with their distro, so they can just generate all of their Windows packaging from their uh, Linux desktop machines uh, very easily. Uh, Android works, uh, iOS works, and also bare metal. So if you have an Arduino thing happening, you can compile, compile with Mesen. And uh, in, in uh, this, you need stuff like upload the target. And these sorts of things are very easy to add. And then you, uh, when I'm doing Arduino development, I just, my, I just always run Ninja uh, upload, which compiles and uploads the thing if, it's, if the, everything works. And there are very few changes in the build definitions that are actually needed. Usually you don't need anything. Yeah, and it has the same build definition because all the parts that have to do with specifying the, the cross environment are not in the build files. They're actually somewhere completely separate. Um, but I, I, probably many of you were thinking, like the most obvious uh, question, which it always comes to people's minds when we talk about cross compilation, uh, which is, what about bare metal embedded COBOL development? And I'm glad to say that we do, we do support that. So there you see, uh, there on the, on the left, you can see the COBOL program for running this uh, external uh, LCD screen. And there's the screen running the COBOL program there. And this is uh, nice and working if you are in this, that sort of thing. Um, uh, other, th other things that you can do when cross-compiling is that you can specify a sort of like an EXE wrapper, and this is a program that you can use the, your cross-build files during the build time. So this usually includes stuff like Wine, where you can run Windows programs, or QMU, which you can use to run uh, like ARM programs on an x86 machine. And this ties in nicely because you can have uh, code generators that you compile and then you're using to generate more source files during the build. So you can just run the executables as they are. Or you can specify that some of the executables should be built with the native compiler and not the cross compiler. And then you can just run them and they'll probably run a bit faster. And you can also run the full test suite of your application with on this. So if, if you're on Linux, you can run your full test suite for Windows when you're running Wine. And uh, as an X system, we're, we're doing pretty well. Uh, it's about four and a half years old. Um, and we have more than 100 contributors at this time, and which is about monthly releases. Um, and it's supported on all of the major Linux distributions, so, so Debian, Fedora, OpenSUSE, and all of those. And they have Mesin in their default package libraries, uh, sorry, package repositories. Uh, we run a fairly extensive test suite. Uh, the, uh, the Docker image that we use for testing, the Linux part is about two and a half gigs of, of all the dependencies that is needed to run all the actual tests. And the building stuff is, is relatively simple, but uh, dependencies are what makes things everything hard. So we, we spend a lot of time thinking about this. And So the, the way that works is that in Mesen you can uh, build any project as a sub-project of a different one. And it's run in a sandbox environment, so it can't access stuff from the outside. And uh, it's isolated, but then from the master project you can reach into it and, and take stuff from there. 
So this makes it possible to have your dependencies either come from the system, as like a, on a Linux machine where you just use the package config files to, to get your dependencies, or you can build them yourself. And the build definition for file for both of these looks exactly the same. You don't really care where your dependencies come from. You just say, I want this thing to be available. And this works cross-platform. There's, there's nothing specific about it. So Windows, OS 10, Android, all you need to do is, is if you're, uh, the dependency that you're using compiles with Mesen on that platform, then you can use it. Uh, this is very similar to, to Rust's Cargo, or uh, D has a similar thing called DOP, and I think Go has something called Go Get. Um, but the thing is that this definition is not tied to any specific language. It's, it's completely language agnostic. So you could use it for any, any language dependency that you care. Uh, this, as a text, this is not probably, uh, okay, sorry. Um, and we have the, uh, this called RapDB which hosts these dependencies online. And, and uh, this works in total cooperation with distro package. So if you are a distro packager, one of the things you hate more than anything else is that people embed the sources of their dependencies inside their packages, and then they build those, and then you have to rip them out, and, you, and maybe they have changed it and all that stuff. So this works in per complete cooperation because you can just say that all I want is, you're not only allowed to use system dependencies, and if you're not having it, those, then it's a hard error. Don't try to compile your embedded source. Uh, and never download anything from the internet. So if you have a, a thing where you must, have, must build all of your stuff without accessing the internet, we can enforce that. This is a bit dry, perhaps, as text. So let's, let's look at a, a dependency demo. So this uh, is a simple program that uses Lua, and it opens a bunch of PNG files. So it depends on Lua, libpng, and then libpng depends on zlib. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So there's the, the uh, build definition file, and th there's a single so uh, C source file, and then there's a subprojects folder, which we'll look into a bit later. So if we uh, cat the build file, it looks like this. So basically, you just define the project, and then you say that you have these dependencies, uh, which are Lua and libpng. And the fallback says that, that uh, where the de fallback dependency is. So it's in a subproject called Lua or libpng. And then you just say, I want to build an executable. And then these are the dependencies that I have. So, and then the subproject folder looks like this. And it, all it has is these three files, which are called wrap files. And if we cat one of those, then it looks like this. And basically, it's just a URL file for where you download the source files and the, the hash, hash code for, for verifying that they're actually the, the real thing and they haven't been MIT. And so there's the source file, and then there's the, the patch file, which in this case adds the, the mess and build definitions because the original project doesn't have them. And then you start uh, run the configuring step. That's what it looks like. And then you can see it downloads libpng. Uh, and it downloads the patch, and it does all the patching. And uh, as you can tell, it says native dependency zlib found yes. So in this case, zlib was available in the system, so it doesn't download and build it itself. It just uses the system one. And then if you compile it, then it looks like this. And then there's 39 st compilation steps for Lua, libpng, zlib, and this executable. And, th and that's it. And this now works works on all the platforms where the libpng and zlib and Lua are available on. And this is quite interesting in, in itself. But what can we do with this? So now that we have this, in, it's time we need to go deeper. We need to all, go all the way down and achieve Pythonception. And ask the question, can you compile CPython with itself? Well, let's find out. Uh, here's a checkout of, of a C Python repository, which I took from the, from the Git master some time ago. And I wrote some of the, the build definitions. And there you see running the mesen command. And it's run, run the configure. So you get all the, the things in there. Uh, I'll check the functions, size of things, all of that. And 
Then you run the build command, which looks like this. So you spot 143, uh, two compiler warnings. And, and uh, for compared to the stuff that you get in Make, this is actually kind of nice because the only thing that is visible are the compiler warnings. And it's not telling you that now I'm going in this directory, now I'm going in this directory, now I'm going in this directory, now I'm coming back, now I'm going then. And all of that goes away because you don't care what, the, what it is. Uh, and then if you run the compiled Python with this H, then you get the help output from the regular Python executable. Which is, is kind of nice, but uh, compiling uh, Python on Linux is not actually that difficult. Um, it's, it's fairly straightforward. So let's go deeper. What about Windows? So here's the screenshot of running on uh, Windows 7, I think, with Visual Studio. Um, LibreOffice, in its infinite wisdom, has decided to scale this picture down for some reason, so it's a bit blurry. But uh, there you can see it's running all the same tests. And then if you run the compile, uh, then you get this. And this, I don't know what those warnings are, but they don't seem to matter. And then if you try to run generated executable in the same way as, as earlier, then what you get is this error message, which I don't know what it is, because I don't really do much Windows development. This was kind of complaining about some missing DLL. But ignoring that, basically, it works. Um, the at le fixing the rest is left as an exercise to reader. Uh, so, uh, so let's look at the performance numbers of, of this thing. Uh, who in here knows how big the configure AC file is in, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, um, wrong slide. So uh, on my four-year-old uh, i3-877 with eight cores, uh, the configure time on auto tools, it takes 13 seconds. And uh, with Mesin, it takes six seconds, which is about 50% faster. Build time is 31 seconds, which goes down to 16, which is, again, about 50% faster. Uh, I, I also ran the test on Raspberry Pi 2, and the configure time on that is 3 minutes and 11 seconds, and went to 131, which is, again, about 50% faster. And the build time is, is from 9 minutes to 4.5, which is, again, about 50%. So 50% so improvement overall. It's, um, this is not entirely fair, because it's not building all, like, all of the same things, but it's, it's roughly about the same. Um, so build definition size. And so how, how many of you here know how big configure AC is on Python? Any guesses? Anyone? Okay. So the correct answer is that it's 5,477 5, lines. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend that you do because it's it's both terrifying and awe-inspiring in the same at exactly the same time. It has still support for stuff you didn't even know existed, and it's probably older than most people in the room. And in addition to that, there's the makefile.pre.in, which, as you can tell, is twice templated, and that's uh, 1,700 lines. Um, and there's some makefiles in the subdirectories, but I, I didn't count those. So in comparison, uh, the Meson build for the same is 629 lines, which is well, like slightly less. Um, this only includes uh, building the core and the essential modules that are parts. Uh, and this has only been tested on Linux with GCC and Windows on Visual Studio, so it probably needs, needs some work on some other ones. Um, but on the other hand, we still have about 6,000 lines of spare until we reach the same same uh, amount of code as the, as the first one. So I'm fairly confident with that, that, that that's achievable. Um, all right, but can we go deeper? Um, so here's something that I thought up. Um, as far as I can tell, this is currently not possible, but it's, it's completely feasible to do. So what if your uh, Python compilation went something like this? So you first you compile enough code code to compile the parser, right? And then you compile the standard library that you have from PI files to PYC files. And then using a fairly simple script, you compile those PIC files into C libraries. Uh, no, sorry, C arrays. So a C file and a .h file, listing those things, right? 
and then you compile the rest of the Python and all the rest of your application that you want. And then you link the Python core plus the modules plus the standard library that you built as C arrays statically. And this gives you a fully self-contained program.exe. And you can run it, and it doesn't need to unpack anything. It doesn't need any file system access or anything. It, it, there's no possible way that it can read the wrong PYC files because it only ex access, accesses them that are inside your own executable. So this would be a sub-projectable Python. And the things that you can do would be, it's basically like freeze or py2exe, or there's a CMake Python, which is a bit like this. But if you have it inside the build system, and it's inside the, the core build of the, of the language itself, then it works on all platforms and all the use cases out of the box. Then you can create uh, cross-platform applications where you embed Python, because it's just one dependency, and you just compile it in, and you start call it, and, and stuff starts happening. And you can ship actual exe files. And there's no file extension circus anymore. Uh, one of the biggest pain points in cross-platform development in Mesin that we had is the shebang line. Because on Windows, you must have the .py extension, because otherwise it doesn't work. On other platforms, you mustn't have them, because that's the distro will say you can't have that. Somewhere, the user being Python points to Python 2. Somewhere, it points to Python 3. And, and it's like, it's, it's an enormous mess. And if the Python exe itself goes away, then all of these problems go away as well. Uh, your applications don't require Python to be pre-installed. On Windows, this is a especially good thing. And they don't try to use the wrong version by accident. You don't get weird symbol mangling thing lookups where some of the symbols come from this DLL, some come from that one. And then you can combine this with uh, GTK or with Beware, um, which is a great project for, for creating a, a multi-platform GUI application. And then you can ship multi-platform GUI applications, which you can compile from your own source into like full executables and just ship them. And your users don't have to think about any of that. Um, going on further, so there was a presentation by, I think, Josh Triplett, how they're using Python where they compile it and they boot directly into UFI. Well, you can do that. You could have bare metal support inside the Python. So Python would be sort of like a micro less micro Python, where if you have a like, slightly bigger thing and you want to control it completely from Python, go ahead. You can do that. Uh, and if there are uh, people who run containers, then you can do stuff like you have your Linux kernel, and you, uh, the only process that's on the system is the Python process. It's just a single process. You launch that. And this has interesting implications because uh, most exploits in the world try to uh, open a shell on the target machine. If your system doesn't have a shell at all, all of these things stop working, which is kind of nice. And, and there's all sorts, uh, like, sorts of scale things that you can do because you don't have uh, your uh, images that you launch are very small. So, um, winding down, so in conclusion, um, Python is set to become a core dependency for a significant fraction of the Linux user land. Uh, currently, it hasn't been. They have been using uh, Make and Shell and Awk and TR and Sed and all of those wonderful tools that we know and some love, um, but which are just complete maintenance nightmares. So those are all going to go away eventually, which is, which is nice. Um, and one of the main things that comes from this is that everything will become faster. So um, for those who don't know, if you run a shell script and you do a string comparison, what it actually does is that it spawns a new process every time you compare two strings. And especially on Windows, where process spawning is slow, uh, then this, like, just being able to do in-process string comparisons is a massive gain. And if we have these new sorts of tools with, with new sorts of things, then new things become possible, um, some of which we probably don't even realize yet. Uh, so coming back to the original question was that all build systems are terrible, and why should I care? So uh, in conclusion, what I would like to say is that the reason you should care is because some build systems are actually fun and exciting. This has been my talk, and I thank you and open for questions.
Who has a question? Nobody? Ah, oh, yes, two. Yeah, no. uh, is this a free thing you mentioned? Uh, uh, just an idea or some actual project we can look at? Uh, so, the, oh, is this, this, is, is, uh, oh, is this microphone on? Oh, okay, okay, good. So, um, this one. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is not uh, at the moment done. It's, it's just that it could be done. Okay. Um, in, in theory by someone else, which is how these things always go. But there's nothing like inherently difficult about this. It's just work that needs to be done. So like you need, um, as an example, if you, I'm, don't, I'm not entirely sure if the, in Python modules, the entry point is always named the same. If it is, then obviously you can't because all of the, the things go in the same uh, same executable, so they have to have unique names. But as an example, the GStreamer uh, multimedia framework, which is like 150 plugins, they have all the macro magic necessary. So, so if you're compiling dynamically uh, or shared libraries, then they all get the same name. And if, if you're compiling them statically, then they get unique names. And something like this would need to be done if there are duplicated symbols, but I'm not aware of the like actual details of whether that's possible. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm curious how you make sure that Mason is still fast when you make a change. So, uh, as I said, we have the, the testing framework, which is in place. And uh, the biggest, so currently when we run CI, it takes quite a long time. So if it gets slower, we will definitely notice it <laughs> quite, quite quickly, in fact. And, and one of the biggest problems that we currently have is that due to some bugs in other parts of the things, we have to do things a bit slower, but only in CI. Uh, in, in regular use, it doesn't matter. This is not an issue that comes up. But for CI, we have to do some fudging. And because of that, it's like 2x slower. But uh, but it's still still pretty fast, and, and um, we're very much counting on the fact that people are running, uh, building their stuff against Mason Master, and if we get slower, they start yelling, and then we'll fix it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Do you have another another question? Yeah. Ah, yes, great. So you talked about uh, compiling for, for Windows, for Mac OS X, and so on and so on. Uh, consider I have to build a product, and it's an embedded product, and I have some um, uh, microcontroller. Uh, can I use Mason to, to work with some uh, uh, not yet known compiler? And would you recommend it? So uh, currently, we only support the compilers that are there. So that's GCC, Clang, ICC, and then like tw 10 different Fortran compilers, which some guy contributed. Um, and we don't, you can compile on a compiler that's not specifically supported because we need to know how you run that. Um, but if you want to add this, we are open for patches. We'll, we love patches if you, if you send in. And it's not actually that difficult. So the, the language support for D was added by one guy who had never seen the code base before in about two days. And just adding a, a, a C compiler, uh, an existing C compiler would probably not be that much of a job. Uh, so that means that you um, have predefined rules for compiling. What if I, in, in, a, in, a, in a project, I want to have my dedicated um, um, options? So. I want to change optimization levels and per what else is, is possible. Is that, is that possible with, with Mason or yeah. is it impossible because the rules are already closed? So what we do is that there's uh, predefined uh, target built optimization types. So there's uh, just debug, there's optimize for speed, release and minimum size, and then there's the uh, nothing at all. And then you can specify your own compiler flags and we just use those and we don't use any of our own. So if you want to override, that's fine. Another question? No? Thank you so much. Uh, the next talk will be done by Nicola Larossi uh, in some minutes. Right. Thank you.